So what I wanted to do today is to talk a little bit about the individual issue of suicide and how you deal with someone who might be suicidal or a friend. And then following on from that, I wanted to throw out, and we're going to talk a little bit about coverage of suicide, youth suicide issues uh, in the media. Now, just to put this in context, I just wanted to show two slides, if I could, please. Um, the first slide here is around the number of suicides. This is from 2010. Um, and it differentiates between sex, and it also is across the age group at the bottom. I'm not sure if everyone can see that. But the point uh, I want to make here is that when you look at the absolute number of suicides, the largest numbers are around from the age of 30, 35, to about 55, four men. Can people see that there up the top? Uh, and then in terms of 15 to 19 year olds, uh, we're down here and then it moves up as young people turn 20 going forward. Now, the other important thing is to understand that for young people, suicide is still the leading cause of death, but in terms of absolute numbers, most of it is happening in that sort of mid-age uh, that mid -age group of men between 35 and 50. Uh, we wanted to show you just one other slide here, and this is looking at the suicide rates for young people aged 20 to 24, uh, and the top graph is for young men, and the bottom graph is for young women. And when we look at this slide, we see that in 1997, which seemed to be an unusually high year, we had extraordinarily high rates of uh, youth suicide. And I think you'd be familiar when we talked about, for young men, this is when Australia was probably having the leading rates of youth suicide for young men, particularly in rural communities around Australia. Since then, you'll see that those rates have been continuing to come down, um, whereas for young women, the rates have been fairly consistent, a few variations since 1989. So I just think it's important that we just give you that context in terms of where those, those numbers are, and obviously some of the people here might want to speak to them as we go into them. So what I wanted to do now is just to, um, to throw to Rosie as a young person, and if you could just share with us a little bit of perhaps one of your first experiences about dealing with the issue of suicide and, and, and what you did then, and then maybe would you do things any differently now? Thank you, Jack. Um, in preparing for this session today, I, I really thought back on my uh, years of experience in youth mental health and I suppose more broadly, uh, including youth suicide. Um, I've been involved with uh, youth mental health since I was 16 or so, but prior to that had had um, a lot of experiences personally that I didn't know how to deal with and I didn't even recognise as mental health or suicide issues. Um, I remember one really extreme example when I was probably 14 or 15. Um, I was at a party and I walked into the bathroom and actually walked in on somebody as they were attempting to take their own life. I walked in and kind of looked at her and she was quite a good friend of mine and I was shocked, and I just said, don't, and grabbed her and pulled her out of the bathroom, and we continued on with the party. I didn't say anything to her. I didn't really say anything to any of my other friends. She knew that I cared because I'd uh, taken her out of the room and kind of stayed with her for the rest of the night, but I didn't bring it up with anybody else, and neither did she, and it kind of remained our little secret. Um, I think for myself, I, I, I look back on that situation, and I didn't panic, I didn't think, I don't want to know about this, I just didn't know about it. I didn't know what it meant, I didn't know what the impact was, and I didn't know what it meant for her. Um, if we move forward a few years, uh, I, in my early 20s, I um, had a similar experience with a friend who had attempted to take their own life, and the way that I reacted, this is, this is at a point in my um, career, <laughs> do I have one of them yet? I'm not sure. Um, that I didn't have a lot of work experience or academic knowledge about youth suicide or anything like that. Um, but my experiences in the reachout.com community, in talking about this issue, in learning about it and understanding how I as a peer can help my friends, had equipped me with these skills that when I learned of, of what my friend had done when I was around 22, I said to her, okay, this is, this is big and this is hard, but there are things that we can do. And I can help you, and these people can help you, and these people can help you. And I took her through the steps and got her, well, she got the help that she needed, but I was able to assist her in doing that. Um, it really made me realize that for me personally, uh, when I'm asked the question, youth suicide, is it okay to talk about it? Yes. I mean, the result for me is that I, as a young person, was equipped 
to help my friend and to be able to get her the help that she needed instead of literally ignoring it and pre pretending that it wasn't a real thing and that I just didn't have to think about it. Thank you. Um, Pat, in terms of in the clinical setting, I mean, obviously you're dealing with this and have been dealing with it for over 20 years. What's your view in terms of raising the issue of suicide with a young person that you think has got some issues? Well, there used to be a myth, Jack, um, that uh, if you talk about it, you'll put the idea into people's head. That was a terrible um, uh, myth, really. We had to dispel that, and um, especially amongst GPs and uh, primary care. And um, yeah, I'd like to, I suppose, put it in context. We don't just suddenly start talking about suicide out of the blue. Suicide nearly always is, is a manifestation of poor mental health. So people are struggling in some way or another, whether we want to call it um, a mental illness or not, but we can say they're uh, experiencing mental ill health or poor mental health or distress, and they need some kind of help. So that's what I see on a day-to-day -day basis in Headspace or in mm -hmm. Origin uh, in our services, and young people are struggling. Um, they're not that well prepared. Um, I mean, it's hard anyway for any of us to cope with, the, with these sorts of uh, problems, but um, young people in particular, they're inexperienced in life. They, that there are very few coping mechanisms available to them. Um, drugs and alcohol, um, mm. self-harm, these are the ways of getting rid of these bad feelings that they're experiencing. And, and, and so self-harm is, is probably a lot more common than, than actual suicide mm. attempts uh, or, or um, more clear-cut ones. And, um, so, so if, we have you, to so if you, for that. example, you've got a, 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 a young person comes into, into um, Origin or into one of the Headspace centres, can you just give people a sense of how you'd sort of walk through the conversation yep. with that particular individual? Yeah, well, I think the first thing, when they walk in the door, there's got to be a welcoming type response. This is what we hear from young people all the time. They've got to feel welcome. And in traditional healthcare settings and mental health settings, they haven't felt very welcome. So we have, we've got to create the right context, the right attitude in the, in, the, in, the, in the people that are working there, from the receptionists to the youth workers to the, the, the GPs, the psychologists, the psychiatrists. Everyone's got to have that right attitude and, and uh, if, you, if you don't have that if you don't have that affinity for young people you shouldn't be there so that's got that's the first thing so there's a, a possibility of trust which has to be earned as well and once you get that sort of you get to first base then and then you can start probably just trying to understand how things are going for that person um, and um, it's not the first question you would, you would ask, but if you see someone who's, who's in a fair bit of distress, you just know that they will be experiencing thoughts of self-harm or, or suicidal ideation. Once you get beyond a certain level of severity, it's gonna be there. Hmm. And, and you know that people, if they're, not, if they're not disclosing that, well, they're covering it up. And there's a thing called the help negation effect. The more severely unwell you are, um, the less likely you are to talk about it. And that's a big red flag for us as clinicians. And this is one of the challenges also in terms of engaging young people and some of the work that Inspire's been doing about young people that wouldn't normally go and see a service or even speak to a professional. That that's something that I think you guys have been involved, involved with. Um, so, uh, look, I, I don't know if, if, um, if Doug or, or Rosie wanted to add anything at this stage or, or perhaps Chris, but I think there's a fairly strong view that it's actually okay to talk about it with an individual, and if someone raises the issue, it's not something we should sort of try and squash away and actually sort of say, oh no, let's, let's talk about something else. Chris, was there anything that you wanted to, or should we, should we move now and talk a little bit about the media portrayal of, of youth suicide? Yeah, let's move on to that. Okay, and so as I mentioned, uh, Chris, Chris has done a number of features um, covering uh, suicides that were happening in Berwick and other places in Victoria. And I first came across um, Chris um, mid last year where he wrote a, a really quite a, um, a wonderful piece about grappling with the responsibilities of being a journalist and covering this issue um, in, in the media. And I, I, it was just sort of wonderful to have someone out there having that, if you like, sort of publicly sort of saying, this is an if issue I grapple with, I care deeply about it, but I want to report about it responsibility. So, Perhaps if you might just sort of share a little bit of your experience, um, that, that would be great. All right, well, I, I mean, I guess the, the traditional um, position for the media, Jack, has been not to report anything about suicides. I mean, there's the, there's the, the sort of um, police language or journalese, no suspicious circumstances or single car accident, um, which uh, if, you, if you decoded it, meant that the person you were referring to had had killed themselves, and I think so. We're 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 moving from a from a position of um, of, of of not saying anything, 
um, into a position where ethically, where, where if, we, if we report with all our ethics and sort of morals intact, we're moving from a position of saying nothing to actually saying quite a lot. Um, it's important, I think, though, to distinguish between different kinds of media in this. I mean, there are, there is kind of um, bottom feeders or, or whatever that will do what they want without... But they don't, work, they don't work for Fairfax? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but if we, if, we, um, if, we, if we use all our, all our ethics and all our morals to report on something which has traditionally been taboo, then I think it's a constructive, positive exercise rather than something with overwhelming negative effects. And, and in terms of like covering that situation in Berwick, I mean, can you share with us just a little bit about some of those dilemmas that you would have been then before you actually sort of pressed the button to send the story? Well, sure. I mean, um, the, the research internationally is ongoing, and Pat might be able to enlighten us a bit more on this, but um, basically the, 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 the traditional fear has been that by reporting on uh, clusters or, or groups of, of suicides that it will increase the risk of people joining that contagion or that cluster. Um, and the figures now in, in Australia show that uh, around 5 to 10% of all suicides in this country are copycats. And about half of those are because of media reporting. So, therefore, whenever you report these things happening, in the back of your mind is mm. the worry. Mm. Mm. And so that was the, the piece you were referring to before, was um, me grappling with that dilemma. Mm. But my conclusion was, in the end, that it's better to talk in a constructive, positive way about something while still telling the truth about it than not talking about it at all. And of course, there are guidelines that have been around this called the Mind Frame Guidelines. I understand that last week or so you were involved in a discussion around that. Can you just share with us a little bit in terms of has, have those perspectives shifted a, much in the last sort of couple of years? And then maybe ask Pat to comment on it as well. Yeah, well, they're shifting a lot. I mean, um, Mind Frame is a federal body who uh, advise media groups on how and how not to report on mental illness, self-harm and suicide. Um, so they essentially provide us with sort of guidelines on how to do that. I mean, I found when I was doing the sort of on-the-ground reporting, I kind of didn't really adhere to them using my own sort of instincts instead. But certainly Mindframe now are, um, and the Australian Press Council are opening the door somewhat to media to hopefully do the right thing in the circumstances that they find themselves in when they're reporting on, on suicide and mental illness. So there seems to be a, a consensus that actually talking about it, you know, as an issue, something facing the community, I don't think there's any question around that. I think p possibly where there's an area of some um, discussion is around how individual suicides are reported and also the timing and the context in which that happens. Pat, you've got, you've got fairly strong views on this, I think. Yeah, well, it's fabulous to hear Chris talk about it in, in this way. That's real progress, um, because my instincts were the same as his, you know. I, 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 as Jack said, I've worked in this area for ages, and we've even got people doing research in suicide prevention in our, in our research centre. And, you know, I, my instinct was that like any of these issues, whether it's you know, child sexual abuse, domestic violence, it's never a good idea to sweep, sweep it under the carpet. It's always going to come back up to the surface. And this is one of the last taboos, as Jack's been saying, talking about suicide. It's been so... And I, and I think a lot of those researchers and a lot, a lot of those guideline drafters were influenced by that taboo subconsciously, and it, it, it affected their judgment on, on what the research evidence was actually saying. Because I went back and I looked at all this research evidence and I found it fairly unconvincing, I've got to say, most of it. It's circumstantial and especially these days with, with social media, what the, what the mainstream media says isn't going to be the main, the main issue actually. Uh, it's word of mouth, it's social media, that's what's driving any copycat phenomenon in my opinion now. And what the conventional media has a chance to do is take a very responsible position and see if they can create disincentives for 
for copycats and, and contagion. And that hasn't really been researched very much at all. There are some studies that have looked at that. So I'm much, very much instinctively on the same page as Chris, and I'd like to have it studied properly so we, we can do it, do it with, without any risk, but actually to, to try to bring it out into the open in the way that we've been talking about. So do you think there'd be any merit in, in doing an analysis of um, the suicides that were happening in terms of Berwick and actually sort of tracking that over time to see how that's... And I'm not sure how many people are familiar, but there was a... You might have seen there was a piece on uh, Four Corners probably about three or four months ago. This is a number of suicides that were um, down in Victoria, just out of Melbourne. Do you think there would be value in doing an analysis? Because the big thing there was that this got coverage in social media um, that was quite extraordinary, and I know there were a group of young people who set up um, a website which was around saying, I think it was like, let's stop suicide, use suicide, but then got inundated with so many requests and people joining that they had to then go and link up with other organisations to be able to deal with the influx. But, but it was that ability to be able to start those conversations that sort of really took off. Yeah, well, one of the main points there was that the uh, local schools were um, generally unwilling to allow uh, local um, and quite progressive thinking um, counsellors and suicide prevention people into their schools. So that was just a sort of an extension of the sort of community denial of what was happening. Um, eventually, some of the schools did let them in. Um, to talk to both teachers and students about, about, about what can be done if they encounter, like Rosie did, mm. these scenarios. But uh, social media went nuts, and usually they didn't get their facts right, people posting on Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr. Mm. Um, yeah. Often, a lot of the information being disseminated quicker than people like me could get it out there was wrong. Yeah, and, and I just think, also, too, there's this question that comes around this is, and I think it informs some of the approaches that people have had over the years, which is around that do no harm principle. And it's always, you know, maybe you are slightly better off to veer on the side of not being as explicit or talking about these things in, in, in a way as you might have in the past. And there's that challenge when something has been so restricted for so long that when you open up, how do you open up in a way that doesn't sort of go too far in the other direction? It's a, it's a really good point. And, and obviously, we don't want to increase the risk. So people have got to be, you know, that's the cautious mindset. But, but then, how, as Chris was alluding to, how do you tell the truth about what happened without actually describing what happened? You know, it's like you're, you're talking in some kind of um, uh, fictional mode, you know? Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a real dilemma, actually, to know how to do this in, in a good way. So we've got to learn how to do it carefully, I think. Mm. Sounds like quite a, um, a standard ethical dilemma that we have across healthcare in general is this, um, the difference between the greater good and harming individuals, and is there, I have no idea if there's any research done here, but is there any um, knowledge in, with stories like this, um, what am I trying to say here? How do we measure the difference between having a negative impact on a small group of copycat people and a positive impact on breaking down stigma and starting conversations and, um, and starting to get people to recognize situations instead of going, as you said before, oh, it was a single car accident. People can recognize that actually suicides are happening in our community and we as members of this community need to be empowered to help prevent that. Even if that's just by recognizing that somebody is in serious distress and I can say, are you okay? And then know what to do if they say no. Um, so that balance, I think, between the greater good, whatever that means, and that individual level is very hard to navigate. And you've also got this conversation taking place, you know, in a society where, with our previous speaker, there's, there's levels of parental anxiety mm. that are just completely off the charts. And certainly, um, this is an issue too, then, is everyone going to be running around and, and worrying about, is my child going to be suicidal? But we haven't been very good at taking, getting, collecting data around suicide attempts by young people in Australia, but I certainly know in the United States, um, there's these surveys that are done every two years looking at what they call youth risk behaviours. In the United States, around 7.8%, or sorry, 7.8% of US high school students will say that they've attempted suicide in the previous 12 months. 
right? 7.8. Now, that, that, that's in a classroom of 30, that's somewhere between two and three. Now, that's a pretty significant number. We don't really have the data here that we've collected. Where we've tended to collect data in Australia has been more about young people presenting um, to emergency services. But, but even, even if it were half that rate, you've still got you know, an MCG full of young people who are attempting suicide each year. So this is a really sort of, it's still a significant issue. There's so many young people not getting help. A lot of those people, and I think the work that Pat and others have done around getting the Headspace Centre centres up and running is a place to go. But they're only going to be able to deal with a relatively small number at this stage, and certainly work at Inspire and others is trying to make those communications happen online. Um, so I think it's, it's one of these things, it's a really significant, difficult issue, but the majority of young people who do attempt obviously don't go on to complete. So I think these are really, they're really sort of challenging issues for us to, to deal with. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so what I just wanted to do is just to ask Doug briefly to talk a little bit about some of the work that you're involved with, with the Young and Well CRC about social media and suicide, and then there's two other points we'll just touch on if we've got time at the end. Yeah, so Chris, you've brought up that the discussion around the, the suicides that occurred in local communities in Victoria, that they extended to social media. And of course, we, well, we're well aware that young people are living part of their lives on social media, and these are public spaces where we talk about them. Um, Pat, you talk about breaking the silence around suicide in community, and Chris, you have a record of responsible reporting around suicide. Before I lead into talking about what Young and Well has done, um, I think the media, um, as a public record of our lives, plays a significant role in demonstrating how we can, how we can talk about suicide responsibly and how we can talk about it as it is currently, inevitably, a part of our lives. And, um, as a member of the community, when, when, I, when I see it in a newspaper, when it's related to where I grew up, I, I feel a bit comforted knowing that it's acknowledged and that it's recognized as something that people in my community have gone through. And so, back to social media. Uh, earlier in the year, the Young and Well Cooperative Research Centre, which is a research centre that brings together over 70 organisations and universities and businesses and technology companies to look at the role of how, to look at the role of technologies in improving young people's mental health. So, on this day, we held a roundtable on young people, social media, and suicide prevention, and we talked about how we can use social media to prevent suicide and how we can talk how we can talk about mental health in those spaces to bring positive messages to young people and how we can provide resources that young people need in social media knowing that they're such active participants that we are such active participants in these spaces and we've also mentioned Mindframe, Mindframe Media, which provide guidelines for the media about responsible reporting of suicide. Um, the, the round table was held uh, jointly in conjunction with them. We resolved on five key issues that we need to look at. Um, and the first one is that the research is having trouble keeping up with technology. Technology companies are having enough trouble themselves trying to keep up with how the population is using technology, let alone young people and children who change the way we do things purely through that. And we've heard a lot about the playful nature of how young people and children approach life. It's the same with technology, constantly redefining the boundaries. We need guidelines for safe and effective engagement online when we're talking about mental health and suicide. When when suicide affects a community, how do we respond online? And following that, how can we, like Rosie has said, how can we empower young people and children to support their friends and talk about it responsibly online? The media can take a lead in changing public discourse around this, but also how, how can we support young people to understand the, be the best ways to talk about it and to be considerate and to when something happens, know what to say and where to go. We need to be able to, as, as sectors, as mental health, as youth and mental health promotion sectors, we need to be able to respond quickly after things like this happen, and guidelines really help with that. And we need to do this in conjunction with the knowledge holders, like Pat and Origin Youth Health and SANE and Mindframe. And 
technology leaders like Facebook and Google and Yahoo. I'm going to give back to you, Jack. Yeah, and so we're starting to see different groups coming together to talk about these particular issues in a way that I think hasn't happened before. But we do go to this issue around the challenge if people talk about evidence base and how we're going to do proper research. Because with, in terms of suicide data, we don't really get the results to about two or three years down the track, which is why I think it's really important that we actually track attempt rates, because that gives us a bit of more of a sort of contemporaneous assessment of how things are going. But then the challenge is, is that the technology has moved on in two, three, four years. And so even if we go and look and do a, a research and evidence base about what about, might have been working in 2013, come 2015, young people are actually not using that technology anymore. So there's a real sort of real dilemmas around this. And so I think there's a number of ethical issues about this thing about doing no, no harm. But how do we actually want to be there in a way that's helpful and engaging with young people? I think one of the things that came out in the previous uh, presentation is that I think as, um, as, as parents and um, as supporters and that, is that the parent's state of mind, I think, is one of the most powerful things in terms of how the young person functions. And certainly in terms of my kids, I'm not very good at doing this, but the sense is that if you can try and leave with your children a sense of your own peace and mind, a sense that happiness exists, at least they know it's there. And, and so I think when we look at a lot of these parental anxieties, part of it, I think, is doing work on ourselves rather, as the spe previous speaker was saying, than spending all the time trying to do the work on the kids. So I think that self-investment is really important. Um, we, 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 we've run out of time. We were going to go to a couple of other things, but maybe if I could just ask Rosie, if, if you're happy just to sort of finish, and so if there's many young... There's a lot of older faces in the <laughs> audience, but if there's young people out there who, who might be worried themselves or about a friend who's suicidal, are, are there things that people can, young people can do? Uh, yes, I'm just going to say two things. Um, I am not a clinician, so I would really just encourage you to go to places like reachout.com, know your helplines. Kids Helpline, Lifeline are available all the time. If you know that somebody is upset, encourage them to seek help, and when you need help, seek help yourself. Um, sometimes that means dialing a number into a phone and handing it to a person. Um, I also just wanted to say as a follow-up to what uh, Jack did at the beginning where we all got a feeling of how we were doing right now in the room, um, something we do at the end of discussions like this with our young people at reachout.com is to always take a moment at the end of a heavy discussion, which this has been, and acknowledge that we've all just been a part of a really important conversation and say to yourself, I want everybody in the room, including you guys, to do this right now, one nice thing, one piece of self-care that you're going to do today so that... For those of you who put your hand up at four or five, you stay up there. And for those of you who are perhaps, perhaps feeling a little lower now, you pull yourself back up. Because these conversations can be draining and they can be heavy. And it's really important that we acknowledge that and look after ourselves after having them. OK, look, we've run out of time. We're going to leave it there. But, but, but thank you very much. And thank you to the panel members, to Rosie, to Doug, to Chris, and, and Pat McGrath. Thanks very much.